Hey, long time no see. I'm going to do a quick video just as a catch up because I haven't done one in a while. First of all, congratulations to Greg at another Bibliophile Reads who finished his 100 book challenge. I'm very inspired by that because I'm just starting on mine. I'm going to list what books I've done. I've only done about five, I think. I spent a lot of time this month reading other stuff that doesn't count for my challenge, like comic books, and I'll talk about those. I was There was a project I was working on Today it didn't go off yet, it got delayed, so I'm going to do this instead. <clears throat> and this will go up Monday, then Tuesday I'll try and do a tag. I haven't posted in about a week. My problem is I wanted to back off a bit on the posting because <clears throat> I don't want to <coughs> spam everybody every day. I wish there was a way you could, as a creator, slow down or limit the number of notifications people get because I know people don't turn off their notifications and it can be annoying to have somebody just constantly getting notified of one person. I would, I'm would, i starting to see why people have more than one channel. When I first started, I was like, why do people have three channels? Why don't they keep all their stuff in one place? But if you like to post a lot of videos, um, you're going to kind of overwhelm people on different subjects. So it's starting to make more sense to me. Um, Try and limit to three a week or so. Maybe I'll do some travel posts on another channel, you know, that I can show mostly for friends and family, but it would be linked here too. So what have I been reading? Okay, so I'm on the 100 book challenge. I finished and I'm on the March of the Mammoths and I am on the Chunkers. The uh, March of the Mammoths is the Chunkers, sorry. And I am on... Uh, there's no place like Rome. <clears throat> so for there's no place like Rome, and for the March of the Mammoths, I decided to do Edward Gibbons, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And I'm counting that as six books on my 100-book challenge because I'm going by number of files on my Kindle, and I have it as six separate volumes on my Kindle. And I'm cheating and calling it as one book on Rome and one book on Mammoths because it's over 4,000 uh, 4, pages in a print edition, the entire six volumes, so that counts as a mammoth. It might take me all year in Rome. It counts as, I guess even if I just finished with the first volume, it counts for no place like Rome. And I did finish the first volume this morning. So volume one of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Excellent book. I could just read his sentences forever. I had some queued up probably too late now though to try and cue them up again oh dear um his personality comes through as a historian i don't know if that was considered avant-garde at the time or not but he's just a wonderful writer edward gibbon i want to learn more about him i know very little i do have a book of his letters or essays or something like that on here somewhere but um Red ones. Okay. End of volume one. See, there's my proof. End of volume one. Um, I bookmarked a couple things to, that I wanted to read here. Um, anyway, I'll just go over other stuff I did too. And so I read that. That volume goes from about the time of Augustine. I mean, sorry, uh, about the time of Augustus Caesar through to about Constantine. So pretty much covers all the Roman history I knew and all the, all the, uh, the um, uh, emperors I knew of. Uh, this book, I believe, goes, all six volumes, goes to about the 1400s. So that's a lot of history. That's a long decline and fall. Hopefully the American Empire has another 1, 1,200 years to go before, um, and you know by then I'll probably be long dead, I would hope, and I won't have to worry about the decline and fall of the American Empire. Uh, let's see what I can find here. This is terribly boring stuff. See, I let more days go by than I wanted to uh, without posting because I have this thing I've always had it. if I don't do something every day I don't do it 
So like when I'm writing, I need to write every day. Some people don't, you know, they can write on the weekends or whatever. But if I don't keep that habit going every day, so I don't know how I'm going to handle this with posting. I might just fall out of the habit or keep falling out of the habit every so often because that's how my mind works. Okay, here's one I wanted to read. This is from uh, I don't know, one of the middle chapters. This is from chapter 12, Reigns of Tacitus, Probus, Carus, and His Sons, Part 1. This is the sentence I like. <clears throat> Such was the unhappy condition of the Roman emperors that, whatever might be their conduct, their fate was commonly the same, a life of pleasure or virtue, of severity or mildness, of indolence or glory alike, led to an untimely grave. And almost every reign is closed by the same disgusting repetition of treasure, of treason and murder. Which is interesting. I know a lot of people, I know it's very popular on YouTube with the bros on YouTube to talk about Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism and, you know, his great personal character in that. But, you know, this book is a good reminder that no matter how you, how you live your life, life itself has something to say about it. You know, Marcus Aurelius ha chose his son as his successor. Commodius, one of the worst emperors, one of the worst selfish, uh, self-indulgent, incompetent, childish emperors ever. And yet Marcus Aurelius is held up today as this great Stoic philosopher because of what he wrote in his personal uh, daybook, The Meditations, to keep himself on track. But it doesn't sound like it really translated into people in his own life. Um, so hopefully no Stoic bros are, are reading this and going to get mad at me about that. But I mean, there's good stuff in The Meditations. Uh, but just remember, people are all human. It's not good to deify, deify people, that's my opinion. Okay, there was one more section I wanted to read there. Um, probably not that important. What else did I read? I read The Age of AI by Kissinger and Schmidt. And I don't remember Schmidt's first name. Kissinger was Henry Kissinger. It's a book about the AI. It's about two years old. It's about the phenomenon of AI that people are talking about all the time and freaking out about. And, and in my opinion, bookmark this, it's, it's nothing. It's going to come to nothing. It's just more and more computer power. It's not sentience. Anyway, um, The Age of AI, AI by Henry Kissinger and Steve Schmidt, or whatever Schmidt he was. It's a pretty basic book. It's like 200 pages of really basic AI stuff that I guess they tried to figure out for themselves. They, they worked up a, a, a bunch of articles they'd written together and, you know, for 200 pages, they had a lot of filler. It's like, you know, goes back all the way to Rousseau and the rights of man and, and some things and then just sort of touches on all the different AI issues that are out there but it's even it's even more basic than a primer so if you're on the internet and you're interested in AI and uh, chat D GDP and those f fake uh, art drawing things that people like to use that to make to make you know what if what if seven of nine kissed Captain America, you know, and all these nonsense things that people like to put together that all look kind of the same to me. Uh, you're not going to learn that much more from that Kissinger book anyway. But I did read it. And uh, so the books I've read so far, I've, read, I've finished five books for my of my 100 book challenge to read 100 books that I, that I own now. before I buy any others. And I included on that some books I have on in my whole queue at the library. So I've read Treasure Island, The 39 Steps. I discussed those. I read a book called Alone by Lauren D. Estelman, my next book up. And I read The Decline and Fall, and I read Age of AI. Next book I'm going to read is called Alive by Lauren D. Estelman. Alone and Alive are books two and three in a series, in a mystery series called Val, uh, about a guy named Valentino, who's a film restorer. He works for the... Uh, I mess this up every time. Not the American Film Institute. I think the... 
some university in Southern California restores films. So he's go, always going off on these adventures to find lost footage of films. Alone, the book Alone that I read was about, he's looking for footage of a Marlene Dietrich film. And of course, he always trips across a murder or something like that. The next one is called Alive, which I'm really looking forward to because um, it's about the Frankenstein monster. Uh, and it's about a particular film in which the Frankenstein monster is portrayed by Bela Lugosi. These books by Lauren D. Estelman are extremely well researched. At the end of each one, there's a total of seven. There's a long bibli bibliography of different different uh, film history books he read. So it's a really fun series if you like film history. I recommend it. Like I said, there's only seven books. They go pretty quick. Um, the rest of the month, I read all those short story magazines I talked about in another video. And that took a lot of time. And where is it? Okay, and I've also been reading a ton of stuff on my Hoopla app. If I'd thought of it, I would have included comic books on my 100 work challenge. I didn't, though, so I, I don't count audiobooks and I don't count comic books. But I did read a bunch of these collections, these DC, collect, or DC and Marvel collections. Here's one called DC Goes to War, which is a collection of many DC war comics over the years. Uh, only one Sergeant Rock story. Sergeant Rock is probably the, the most famous DC uh, World War II character. These co these comics were very, very big when I was a kid. Uh, you know, a little kid would, around the time of the Vietnam War, they were still making these World War II comics. The, the focus kind of changed over the years. Um, <clears throat> They and there's a few other characters like the haunted tank was a character, was I mean was a was a, and there's one haunted tank story in here too. Uh, the haunted tank was a guy who's a tank gunner in World War Two who, uh, for some reason, is obsessed with the Civil War the the Confederate Civil War general Jeb Stuart who, uh, being in. A cavalry general has some relationship to World War Two cavalry, which was, which was, which includes tanks. So the spirit of Jeb Stuart is watching over the tank, which I kind of liked those stories when I was a kid. Now it kind of seems kind of silly. Like why would, why would your guardian angel be a, a Confederate general if you're trying to win a war? Anyway, times change. Uh, then I had read. Uh, Tomb, Tomb of Dracula, which is about five volumes. Uh, I read the first one last month, I guess, and it's that's a great series. Mostly written by in in the seventies, written in the seventies, by Mark by by Marv Wolfman, and for the most part, and uh, drawn by. Gene Colan, who's one of my favorite artists back then and still is. He's very famous as a Batman artist and as a horror comics artist. Uh, just a fantastic series all the way through. Uh, you know, there's a great cast of characters of these descendants of the original people in the, in the novel who would have who would have, who were fighting um, Dracula. So it's like the you know the the grand descendants of. Uh, there's a guy named Drake, who's a descendant of Dracula himself, who's trying to kill Dracula, and then there's a Van Helsing, and then there's a uh, uh, Harker, and wonderful series that got me on too. Because and there was a crossover with another series that that Marvel did around the same time, called a Werewolf by Night. See what happened in the early '70s is the Comics Code Authority, which used to be the self the self designed censorship group that that Marvel and DC and the, the big comic companies put together in the 50s when they were getting harassed by Congress for over violence and pretty much ended the EC line of comics and the horror comics that all the, all the companies got together and, and created the Comics Code Authority to self-police themselves, kind of like the, the movie rating system in the 30s. And they banned a lot of stuff in the 50s and then over the years they became a little now they're gone of course it's not 
a, a thing anymore. But by the seven, you know, they times change, and and when they originally created it, they had banned all kind of monsters, all kind of creatures, like they had banned vampires, werewolves. By the seventies, this sort of looked out of date, I guess, to the people. So they thought, okay, you can do stories about werewolves, you can do stories about vampires. So that's when Marvel created their horror line, the Tomb of Dracula, Werewolf by Night, and they did a House of, and they did a Frankenstein one for a while. I haven't been able to find those. Uh, the Dracula one ran seventy issues. That was the most popular. Werewolf by N Night ran forty three issues. It was mostly written by Doug Moench, which is. Who's, who's an okay writer. He's no Marv Wolfman. He's no Roy Thomas, but he did an okay job with it. Started out being being drawn by Mike Plug, who's a great artist. And it was some of Mike Plug's earliest work, or maybe his very earliest work at Marvel. Uh, I really enjoyed Mike Plug's work. And then the next artist on the series, his name I don't recall. I'm sorry. He's okay too. He's not in the pantheon like Mike Plug is or like Gene Cohen is. But it <clears throat> it was a good series. Uh, it's their imagination of a werewolf. They couldn't obviously use like Dracula and Frankenstein are in the public domain, so that's no problem. But they couldn't obviously use Carl Talbot, the uh, the werewolf from the Universal movies, because that was an original character. So they had to come up with another original werewolf character. There's no real accepted literary public domain version of a werewolf that is commonly I think there are a couple of werewolf books but none that's common, commonly known the way that say the Frankenstein monster is or Dracula is or uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is or the Invisible Man is all those other characters and for like a Gill Man like uh, Creatures of the Black Lagoon, and for werewolves, you have to come up with your own original character because those, the, the creature from Black Lagoon and the Wolfman are characters created by Universal Studios for the film series. So their wolf is kind of like a cross between Spider-Man and Hulk because he's eighteen. He becomes a werewolf when he when he turns eighteen because of a family curse, which is pretty cool because he doesn't know whose father is because he's, he's being raised by his mother and his stepfather. His father died a long time ago in Europe and and so he just suddenly starts becoming a werewolf um, when he's 18. And he's trying to protect his main, his main sort of goal is to protect his sister who's younger than him. I get it. She's 16 or 17. Um, he's trying to f get the cure before she becomes a werewolf too. That's one of his early sort of problems, and so, and as a werewolf, he. They they made the interesting choice. Roy Thomas sort of plotted the first, uh, issue, the, the sort of outlined the character. D Doug Moench took over, but. They, made it a first person comic. So in the little thought balloon, I mean, not the little thought balloons, but the little narr narrator boxes, the yellow narrator boxes, when people aren't talking, they are all in first person by this guy who has the ridiculous, even by comic book standard stupid names, even by old fashioned comic book standard stupid names, this, this character has the stupidest name. He's, his name is Jack Russell. So I guess he's a little terrier, which is, I mean, I guess it's the only name you could give him that was the name of a dog as well, but it's a stupid name for a werewolf. So anyway, Jack Russell, 18 years old, kind of like Spider-Man, just a teenager, becomes a werewolf, and, he's, and he kind of like run, runs around like Hulk most of the time. He's got just, you know, everything falls off, but everything gets ripped off but his pants. He sort of retains, unlike, say, Tarl, how, Carl Talbot, Larry Talbot, I've been saying Carl Talbot, but Larry Talbot, Lon Chaney, um, who just becomes a savage animal. Jack Russell sort of retains his intelligence. Um, so he's a little more like Hulk, where he's, you know, he's, he's, he's in there somewhere as a thinking human, uh, trying to control what he's doing. But it's, it's an interesting series, and he did a lot of crossovers. They tried to do some different things with the character here and there. To, to keep it viable, but it only lasted 43 issues, which is a fair run, but not as long as um, 
as Tomb of Dracula. But I would like... Uh, Tomb of Dracula, I don't know why they don't make that into a movie. Uh, why Marvel doesn't do that. They could do that. They made everything else. Then I read, uh, and based on... I'll try and credit this person if I can, if I can find the quote, but I was watching Michael K. Vaughn's videos on Savage Sword of Conan and the new Conan series from who's ever doing it now. Conan, sorry. I, I always call him Conan because that's what I called him when I was a kid before the movie came out, but now everybody calls him Conan, which I guess is right. And this person in the comments said, you should really, if you are interested in Conan comics, you should read The Sumerian, which is a French series that was a, but that's been translated into English where they're really gritty, really uh, faithful to the uh, original pulp stories and uncensored. And I, I did read those. They're, I guess they're called The Sumerian because of a rights issue. They wanted to distinguish them from regular comics, but he's called Conan in the comics. I mean, in these comics, there's four volumes of them. They each adapt two stories, so that's a total of eight Robert Howard stories adapted. I really like the the art on volume one. You can't really see it here. On volume one, story one, which is Queen of the Black Coast. Is that the first one? Yeah. Um, let's see if it gives credits here. The first The first volume adapts of the Sumerian adapts Queen of the Black Coast and Red Nails, two of the best Conan stories. And I'm going to have to look up the artist because I think of all the four volumes, my favorite artist was the one who did the did Queen of the Black Coast. And there's uh, quite a variety of different creators on these. From They're published by Ablaze Publishing. Um... I really enjoyed them. Each of the volumes contains not only the the comic adaption, but the, the full text of the original story that it's adapted, including volume four, which adapts the only Conan novel, which was uh, Hour of the Dragon, sometimes published as Conan, Conan, the, Con Conan the Conqueror. And... <clears throat> And they published the whole Conan the Conqueror novel in there too, I think, without cuts. I didn't really read, I didn't read them in, because I've read them before. I didn't read the prose, uh, the the prose reprints in these collections because it would have been hard to read on my uh, as PDFs on my screen anyway. And I've got them all in another thing. I th I, I would like to do a. a a reread of those. They do not adapt the Tower of the Elephant, which is probably as most people say. Probably one of the three best stories. I would say the three best, the four best, my favorite four best Conan stories are Queen of the Black Coast, Red Nails, both adapted here, Tower of the Elephant, not adapted, and The Frost Giant's Daughter, which sometimes goes by a different name too. I have it in some cheapy old public domain collection under a different name um, called Warriors of the North or something generic like that, but and uh, The Frost Giant's Daughter much shorter than most of the stories most of, of Howard's Conan stories I really like it the, the one the, the version in the, the Sumerian which I think is in volume 2 is is um, oh man it's really nasty yeah so that's very like make sure they block if you read that one, make sure the kids aren't around. Um, very raunchy, erotic version of The Frost Giant's Daughter, but I liked it. And uh, Beyond the Black Circle and, and or what's it called? People of the Black Circle, which is a story I don't like as much. And there's another one, Beyond the Black River, which is okay too. They do as well. But it was really nice to see these adaptions of three of my favorite stories. So I read all those comics. Um, now, I'm like I said, I'm going to start reading Alive. I wish I had that. Maybe I can find the cover of that. It's a good cover because it shows <clears throat> Bell Lugosi as the Frankenstein monster, which is cool, at, which he played in some of the later films. 
played it in uh, which one did did Lugosi play the Frankenstein monster not son of Frankenstein because he played Igor in that Ghost of Frankenstein Ghost of Frankenstein that's the one uh, Bela Lugosi played the Frankenstein monster in Ghost of Frankenstein where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay, so this is about the time when I run out of steam, and hopefully people are, are clicking away so they don't have to see me futz around. But um, I'm going to give it one more try. There it is, alive. Oh. It's not going to let me make a big picture of it, though. So that's it. I've got to do my my newbie tag soon I think because I'm really not being a newbie very much longer I wanted to get a few different kind of things down and really know what I want to do with my channel uh, Alive by Lauren D. Esteman and then the next one is Shoot which I believe is probably about western movies uh, Valentino Mystery there this series is not that well known I don't think he's still writing it the um, the most recent one is Vamp, which I, which I imagine is about Theda Berra, the silent movie star. Um, but Lauren D. Estelman has a lot of different series going, and I don't know if this is his, if this is as well known as his, some of his others. But he's an interesting character. This guy Valentino, who looks like Rudy, who looks like the silent film star Rudolph Valentino. And who restores films and incidentally solves murders and other crimes as like you do, you know. You know how it is when you got a series when you're a series character, you're always running across murders, no matter what. All right. Well, I just wanted to catch up. I hope people are still watching these and find value in them. I appreciate people that have subscribed and that that watch without subscribing I appreciate you too all I really wanted was a few subscribers because uh, when I started like, probably like everybody I thought like, what if nobody subscribed what if what if I get zero subscribers which is why I didn't tell any friends because I thought well I'll, I'll have like I'll tell 20 people I know and I'll get five subscribers out of that and they'll never go back to YouTube and I'll just have this this channel where I talk to myself but I really appreciate when people make comments and if you don't want to, uh, you don't have to. Uh, if you want to hit the like button, or just let me know that you're watching, or you could do like uh, like Kelly at Books on My Reading says. You know, you can just do an emoji, emoji, or or a thumbs up or something in the comments if you just want to let know people that want to let the the creators know that you've got this far, that you value what they're doing, and. I, I do enjoy it. I've met a lot of great people here already. I hope to meet more. I wish I had more hours in the day to watch every channel that, that I enjoy because there's so many good channels out there and I really enjoy hearing what other people are reading and I hope, I hope you feel the same about this and we'll talk again. Thank you.